Hi, I am Ibrahim Kuschu, the CEO of the Next Minds. I am also a member of the Information Literacy Working Group of Information for All program of UNESCO. Today, it's a great pleasure to be with you, and I will be talking to you brain and machine interfaces and how this relates to information access and especially our right to know. I will do this through my presentation. So let me share my presentation with you. Yes. Now, today I will talk to you new technologies, brain and machine interfaces that uses artificial intelligence and how this influences the form of the information. There will be a new form of information resulting out of use of these brain machine interfaces and how the means of connecting to information is changing through these new technologies. Now, I'm an artificial intelligence expert, but I devoted most of my work life to improving quality of life of others through information and communication technologies. Also for more than 15 years as being founder of the mobile government field, I work with more than 500 experts all around the world. And we wrote strategies and roadmaps to central governments so that they can offer better services to citizens using mobile technologies. And we work especially for underserved communities so that we, we can improve the quality of life of these underserved communities. I was also part of a large scale research with the University of Washington funded by the Gates Foundation, where we looked at how people access information in 26 developing countries. And recently, in collaboration with Institute for Information Technologies in Education, we published a book on artificial intelligence, media and information literacy, human rights, and freedom of speech. This can be found on the internet and it's freely available. Now let's start with some definitions. Now definition of intelligence is very tricky because depending on which field you are, which discipline you are in, the definition may be different. In fact, there is a publication where they can, they have cited more than 100 different definitions of intelligence. But for the sake of artificial intelligence, and also for this discussion, my definition is capacity to reduce uncertainty so that we can adopt to the changes in life situations and the problems that we are facing. This intelligence leads us knowing better about the, and our environment, our problems, or any issues that we are facing so that we can create adaptive solutions. Now, artificial intelligence is capacity of machines to show such intelligence. And this should also uh, lead us knowing better about the problems and creating adaptive solutions to the problems. Now, there are lots of technical issue, technical details about artificial intelligence, but to keep it so non-technical, I'd like to mention two important characteristics of AI systems. One of them is that AI systems work like a data hungry monster. They can go out and about and collect waste amount of data that we call big data and from various sources in various forms such as text or image or videos. Now this is very important for information access because in this way we can collect by giving certain criteria intelligently some of the uh, relevant, reliable, and right amount of information. It also works as a gentle tailor. When we need information, we can access this information customized for us and serving only our desires and need. And also we can work with reliable, relevant, and right amount of information at the right time that we need. So AI systems can help us in various ways. If AI systems are used in a good way, they can really enhance our right to know. In this case, we deal with our preferred information. A preferred information is the one that we believe that is good for us. We believe that's good for us so that we can resolve issues in our lives. For example, if I am looking for a job, AI systems should be able to help to remove discrimination or gender bias, for example, so that there are equality in job search. Also, 
if I am looking to educate myself in certain topics, say in brain and machine interfaces, artificial intelligence systems can help me to find right amount of information according to my level so that I can work effectively and educate myself much more effectively. But if used not in a positive way, AI systems can be a little bit abusive to our right to know. In this case, I want to mention to you two types of information, dictated information and forced information. Dictated information is the one that we, we are almost familiar. In this case, other people think what is good for us rather than ourselves. For example, if you remember targeted disinformation in the Cambridge Analytica case, or misleading recommendation when you are doing, say, a YouTube research, and then they send you some information that you, you actually don't need, but they think that you might be needing. Misinformation and the fakes, video or, or um, fake news, they are all part of the dictated information. For our talk, what is important is forced information. In this case, other people de decide and force certain information to us so that they can get the, their desired behavior from us. In this case, these brain machine interfaces work directly with our brain. This could be a two-way communication. Either they can read out the signals from our brain or they can also, or both, they can also send back some signals to our brain and expect us to uh, behave in a certain way. Now let's look at the examples of this situation. Let's start with body and machine interfaces, which is a generic form of brain machine interfaces. In the body and um, machine interfaces, we can talk about these variable devices that we are all familiar with. For example, smart watches, uh, wristbands, those devices which are tracking our health records, those devices which are enhancing our vision, such as intelligent glasses, and any other body-mounted body sensors. Also important are intelligent prothesis. For example, if, somebody, if some person loses their arms or legs, they can be, there, there can be intelligent prothesis for, uh, for the replacement of their lost body parts. In this case, this intelligent body part can interact with our body and sometimes with our brain, even wirelessly, so that we can control better this device. But what is most important for this talk is brain machine interfaces. In this case, as I explained to you, there can be a direct access to our brain, either intrusive or non-intrusive. And, in the, and, and the brain waves can be read, and this can be used to control an external device, such as an artificial uh, arm or a wheelchair or a video game, for example. And then the data processed from these external devices may be uh, inserted back as a signal to our brain so that we can exert other behaviors. Now let's look at some of the uh, <clears throat> current examples. The, probably one of the most well-known example is the Neuralink project of Elon Musk. In progress reports, there are various uh, types of this uh, brain machine interfaces are being reported. Basically, this is a, a chip which is inserted to the skull, and that chip has tiny, 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 tinier than the hair, pieces of hair, uh, and it, it can be inserted into our brain, and they can read signals from our neurons. In the early report, it has been shown that um, a pig's brain signal can be uh, detected so that we can know which muscle is moving and which leg of the animal will be moving before the animal actually moves that leg. And this has a significant implication because this uh, deals with an issue of the free will. If you are interested in philosophy, you can see how important is that knowing certain behavior will be happening before that certain behavior is exerted. 
In the other um, report, uh, a monkey has been shown that to, show, uh, to play a simple game called Pong successfully, this video game successfully, without touching joystick. The animal bird was using only its brain waves to control the video game and successfully play the game. What is most important in this last report is that Neuralink has been using more than 2,000 electrodes. This means around 2,000 uh, signals from around 2,000 neurons. And this is significantly much more than any other experiments done to date. Another significant research and experiment is from the University of Washington. And in this case, human experiments are involved. In one of the particular experiments, three people's brain waves were connected to each other in a non-intrusive way that's outside the skull, in a non-intrusive way, way. And two people helped the third person to be able to play a video game. Their only communication was through the brain waves. And this has successfully been implemented. And the third person was very successful in playing the video game. This project is called BrainNet Project and still continuing. Another example is this tiny, tiny chip, which is powered through ultrasound and also operated through ultrasound. Using ultrasound, this tiny chip can be inserted just under the skull and it can collect brainwave data from the brain and, and send it out. And also it can receive signals and send it out to certain parts of the brain. Now, most of these research in brain machine interfaces are, are, um, uh, are funded by the United States um, a defense agency, DARPA, and one of the important uh, projects is called N3, Next Generation Non-Surgical Neurotechnology. And this has been done in collaboration with six universities. The common part of this uh, brain machine interface uh, research is that most of them are non-intrusive and it is possible to read and write, write data to the brain. And this, uh, result of these experiments show that it is possible to control external machines and other brains as well. But what's significant to note here for our uh, discussion on information access is that you can receive information directly from the brain and then use it to control an external device and then send back information back to the brain and try to see certain uh, behaviors coming as a result of this signal being received by the brain. So reading and writing to the brain is very, very important part of this research. Now, so what are the implications of this for us in terms of information access and also information in terms of our right to know? Now, in terms of information access, we can see that the form of the information is actually changing. The information is no longer text or image or a video. It is just brain signals. Ideally, you could think about a scenario where if you want to tell a story to your kid, you don't really have to read a book. You can just imagine the story and through your brain waves, nowadays wireless connections are also possible, through your brain waves, you could get your kid to be able to know about this story. That's a significant, significant improvement in the form of information. This is also changing source and the target and medium of the information. Now, we are very much used to using external sources like such as printed media or social media or any other source of information but in this case, the source of information becomes directly the brain and the form and the target of the information is brain. So you can receive data from the brain and send back data to the brain using artificial intelligence 
power systems. What does this mean in terms of our right to information? Now, we are very critical that information, access to information is a right. But in this case, there could be certain AI systems designed to send deliberate signals to, to people's brains, an individual's brain, and this can influence the future of the society. Actually, it is also possible to send this forced information designed by AI systems and using uh, brain and machine interfaces, this forced information can result in involuntary behaviors. And so that makes us very, that makes us uh, to be very critical about our right not to receive information. We are now interested in having a right to access to information, but in this case, if there is, if there are some intelligently designed AI systems to interfere directly with the brain, then we will be talking about our right not to information because we do not wish to receive undesired information. We do not want to receive information that might make us behave in a certain way that we would like. Or if you think about this as a society, so right not to information becomes much more important. I'd like to leave it here, just giving you some soft examples. For example, uh, a tired worker working all day can be convinced, can be persuaded to stay after hours by just sending certain signals or making this person more energetic and, and to persuade the person to work over time. This kind of uh, forced information, if it is forced, it can change our eating, reading, leisure, and many other habits. So I gave you some simple examples, but you can think about more serious and perhaps more dangerous ones. So I'd like to leave you just a short information about the next minds and also my short bio. And here, it is uh, my pleasure to be able to talk to you and I'd like to thank you to the organizers giving me this opportunity. Wishing you happy and healthy days. Have a good day. Goodbye.